Okay, thank you everyone for being here today. I am not uh, Chair Leda Littleton. Um, Andrew Farmer, just sitting in for her. Busy time of year, so she's out presenting some bills, doing some things that uh, she needs to get done. As soon as she gets back, I can promise you that I will get out of this seat and let her in it. So with that said, Madam Clerk, can we uh, take the roll? Thank you. Representatives Bricken. Here. Farmer. Here. Gant. Here. Garrett. Present. Harris. Here. Jernigan. Yep. Powell. Stevens. Here. Chair Lady Littleton. Chairman Farmer, you have a quorum. All right. Thank you so much. Members, any uh, comments or recognitions before we start committee? Seeing none. Uh, we do have a calendar. I want to make a few announcements off this calendar before we get started. Item 1, House Bill 330. Uh, it's been taken off notice. So without objection, House Bill 330 off notice. Moving on down, item four, House Bill 1258. Actually, strike that. Item six, House Bill 1139 by Representative Miller, off notice. Any objection? Seeing none. And we have, excuse me, yes, item eight, House Bill 1032 by Representative Shaw. Uh, he's asked for that to be taken off notice. Any objection? Seeing none. Off notice. And I believe that's all the preliminary. He, he does. He does. So if we could, that's all the announcements with regards to the bills that can be taken off notice. Um, we do have Representative Shaw here. Do I see Representative Alexander? She is here, ma'am. Um, item 2, House Bill 940 is yours. Members, we have a motion and a second. Motion. Very good. Ma'am, and you have, I'm looking at two amendments. The latest one is House Amendment 6208. That is correct. That's what you move forward with. Members, we want to go ahead and get that on the bill. Motion. Looks like we do. All those in favor of adopting House Amendment 6208, House Bill 940, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. Ayes have it. Now we're back on the bill as amended, and, and you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Committee. This is April's law, and um, basically uh, what this law does it will increase the priority given to child safety, their well-being, their health in any state court. It prevents child abuse in situations that have been shown to increase the likelihood of children will engage in harmful behavior. So what this does is it establishes a uh, credits for a continuing education for our judges across the state that will help them to know how to recognize child ab abuse when they see it so that they don't put a child back into harm's way again. That's basically what this bill does. It is uh, two um, continuing hours of training per year just in their normal uh, continuing education and uh, no more than uh, for for, it's for 10 hours over five years or two hours each year. Okay. With that, I renew my motion. Questions been called. Is there any objection? Here, none. Are we ready to vote? All those in favor of. 940, moving out to civil pool, say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, you move out to civil pool. Thank you, Chair Lady. Thank you, committee. I'm going to take a personal moment for a while without objection. I have a shadow today, Anna uh, DiCarlo. She's a friend and a constituent from Pleasant View. Let's make her welcome, please. So next on the calendar, we have um, number three. Item um, 630 re by Representative Leatherwood. Motion Properly motion and second. You're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, Lady and Committee. Um, this bill addresses two of the legislative concerns uh, that came from the Comptroller's DCS audit. Uh, the two concerns were caseload cap being calculated on averages. This puts in hard caps and will roll them in over the next few years. And it also addresses the concern of non-consensual sex acts 
at residential DCS facilities uh, that weren't always being investigated. So again, this legislation comes as a result of the comptroller's audit of DCS, and this is the two comptroller's recommendations for fixing those problems. Okay. And Thank you. Uh, the amendment was added on in uh, sub, correct? I think, or did we put the amendment oh, last, on last okay, week? Okay, right, okay. I wasn't here. Okay. Okay, so you're right. Uh, are there any questions for Representative Lutzlid? Representative Bricken. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I raised this issues last week, and I still get a, <clears throat> some heartburn about fixed case, um, whatever you call it, thresholds being laid out when we are already well away from even making the caseloads we're dealing with right now. Um, and I certainly, I, I just think in, in the DCS, the level of cases are so different. I mean, the assignment of what, the case levels from level one, two, or three, the number of those certainly would depend on case managers. I just hate this kind of this, this fixed grid that we're putting in place here. Um, I just think there's a better way. I'm not smart enough to know what it is, but I just don't like this approach. Um, so again, um, that's all I want to say. Any other questions? I've worked on this bill for a long time. When I first came, it was a, it was a, a really a, a, the, what am I trying to say? The employees, the Tennessee, the e TEA, they were for this, and I worked with them on this for years and years. And so now I think it's in the right pr place that it needs to be. And I think there are provisions in there. If, if something happens and you can't have workers, they're not there, that provision is there. So thank you for bringing this, and um, I feel proud to vote for it today. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Questions question been called. Without objection, we'll be voting on House Bill 630, moving out to civil pool as amended. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Aye, no. <laughs> the ayes have it. If you want to be recorded as a no, so tell the clerk. Thank you. Thank Madam you. Next, we have item number five, uh, House Bill 164, by Representative Butler. Probably motioned and second. So, and you do have an amendment? Yes, dear lady. <coughs> that is five, six, seven, five. Is and that's what I have vote. as well. Probably motion and second. Let's get the amendment on. All those in favor of amendment five, six, seven, five going on to House Bill uh, 164, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. You are recognized on 164 as amended. Uh, thank you, Chair Lady and Committee. The amendment really rewrites the bill, and I uh, know we had a deep discussion over this bill uh, several weeks ago, and then we have worked with the Department of Children's Services to amend this bill, uh, which really removes Section 1. So really all the bill does is just streamline the process, which DCS would be able to use, and then, then actually includes... Uh, uh, requiring the courts to hear these in 30 days so these things can be expedited uh, and the objective here is simply to to streamline the process for DCS or anybody in this situation to be able to get these through the court system and through the process and allow the judge that can waive the 180 days requirement in this bill as well so uh, I renew my motion and stand for any questions and these are the safe haven babies the yes, ones the, yes yes sure we all understand that they're the ones that are left, and this just makes it an easier process for them to be adopted as soon as possible. Are there any questions? Seeing none, are we ready to vote? All those in favor of House Bill 164 moving out to civil pool as amended, say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Ayes have it. You move out Thank you, committee. to a civil pool. Next, we have number seven, House Bill uh, 868 by Representative Shaw. 862, I apologize. Properly motions and second. Uh, do you have, I think you have an amendment? I do have an amendment that makes the bill, Madam Chair. And what number is that? Do you, 
What amendment number do you have? Uh, that is amendment 004621. Probably motion and second on the amendment. All those in favor of adding amendment 4621 to House Bill 862, say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. You are recognized on 862 as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. And let me first of all thank you for working with me on this legislation and for uh, permitting us to carry it. It came out of our summer meetings. And we appreciate that very much. Uh, and of course, what the uh, the, this bill does is exactly what the amendment says. The department should provide juveniles who are in the department's custody and placed at a youth development center, hardware secure residential facility, as well as juvenile detention centers that's licensed or approved by the department with access to psychological and behavioral health services that offer this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, this bill would provide them with that services. And of course, with that explanation, renew my motion and stand for any questions. Thank you. And this is one of the bills that came out of the Juvenile Justice Ad Hoc Committee that we served on. And we think it's very important that some type of mental health is available to those juveniles at all times. So I was hoping for some of it to be full time, but the fiscal notes just not possible right now, but virtual is better than nothing. So, yes. Are there any other questions for Representative Shaw? Questions been called. Without objection, we'll be voting on House Bill. <laughs> I've got it marked. Eight six two as amended, going out to civil pool. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. You move out to civil pool. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. So. Next, we have number nine, uh, House Bill 1515 by Representative Shaw. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and just prior to number nine, uh, uh, I'm in the communication business, and somehow or another, I didn't get the communication about eight, but I'm, I'm happy with that. I just, <laughs> eight was taken off notice. But number nine, of course, is uh, it, it's, this bill comes to me from uh, Senator Ackberry, and what it does is, this bill provides for some compensation for parents who are getting divorces if they'll take the, uh, thank you. Okay, and you do have an amendment? I do have an amendment that makes this bill, yes. And I'm trying to get my amendments in order here. I believe that is, that's 1515, right? Yes, sir. Number nine, just bear with me just a moment. Okay, the, the amendment for this particular bill is amendment, uh, hold on just a minute. Okay, I'll be 1270, is that the amendment? No, I right. have uh, 5917. Oh, okay. 591. I'm sorry, I got a lot of papers in my hand here. Yes, ma'am, I got it right here. 5917. And of course, this amendment, what this amendment does, this amendment actually makes a bill. And what it does, it does what the amendment says. Of course, it gives some special instructions for pre marital preparation courses, the completion of which exempts the individual from having a to pay the $60 fee that will be charged if they should take the course in case of getting a divorce, they, that $60 fee is deducted for them taking that pre course and giving them, uh, those, especially those who have children, and giving them an opportunity to, to uh, not having to pay that fee. So, uh, renew my motion. Take any questions you might have. Is that a requirement? It's not a requirement, no ma'am. It's okay. not a requirement. It's okay. just if you wish to do that. Are there any questions? Representative Garrett, you're recognized. I've just got a question regarding the, the amendment goes into providing financial documents within 45 days after divorce is filed. Is that what this amendment does as well? Uh, I, I think what the amendment speaks to is that if, the, if they follow the instructions of what it's asking them to do, these are some things they would have to do, but if that is if they follow the instructions, but if they don't, I don't think it would matter. I hope I'm understanding what you're asking me. 
You're right, Kenneth. Uh, maybe, maybe not. I'm, I'm reading in the amendment. Within 45 days of filing a complaint for divorce or an answer to such a complaint, the filing party must file financial documents. Yes. Which so. are a very contentious, potential contentious issue in a divorce setting, and you're making parties within 45 days basically compel discovery. And so we have rules in discovery that allows people to ask for documents for folks, especially in a divorce setting for marital issues, and this would temper the discovery process, if I'm reading the amendment right, by making parties produce financial documents within 45 days, this can certainly take longer to compile someone's financial records mm -hmm. within that amount of time, and you are not required to do that if the opposing party has not asked for those documents. So you are putting, an, you are putting the court with that paragraph with a lot of issues for discovery purposes in litigation surrounding a divorce. And so that's why grave concerns mm -hmm. about this particular paragraph as it relates to the discovery process in a lawsuit. And I just want to make sure when you explained it, that part wasn't discussed. Yes. So I want to make sure that that's what you're intending for this amendment to do regarding a parenting, a parenting seminar already has to be filed with the court if there's minor children for divorce, but you are requiring discovery, super discovery within a super amount of time after a divorce is filed, and that's gonna complicate a divorce proceeding. So I wanna make sure, is that what your intent to do with this Good legislation? Sure. What, I want, what I want to say to you, uh, Mr. Chairman, is this comes from one of your lawyer friends. <laughs> And sometimes you all put information in there that maybe we don't understand. Now, I'm carrying this uh, for Senator Agberry on the House side. I don't want to speak to what her intentions were, but what I do think is that this passed on in the Senate. But if it would make you comfortable, and I don't know if we have time to roll it to find it out, I don't have a problem with that because I am carrying it her on her behalf, and I did not discuss that matter with her. I want to be totally honest with you. I do think that would probably be a good idea because there's going to be problems with getting financial information from your financial institutions within 45 days, mm -hmm. absent a subpoena requesting yeah. that information. So this, this would be worth further discussion to see if this is practical. Representative Shaw. Could if I could make a request to, because of the lateness to move it to full and get this discussion, and if you need it to deny it in full, could we do that? Because I do not have that question answered here today. I want to be totally honest with you. Representative Garrett. I, that's not my call, <laughs> but I'm very uncomfortable passing this legislation okay. like it is that would upend litigation in a divorce matter by requiring huge documents for trial, which can be a year later, <laughs> sure. within 45 days sure. of filing the complaint. Or so that's, that's problematic. Chairman Farmer, did you have a question? Okay. Well, we had some more comments. Are we, you go ahead. Representative Gant. Thank you, Madam Chair. Could it, would it be possible if we could roll this to the hill and maybe he can come back before we adjourn and provide the answer that Chairman Garrett's looking for. You could do that. Without objection, we'll roll to the hill. That's right, and I'll, I'll run, get a quick answer and come back. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee. Thank you. Next up is number 10, House Bill 1403 uh, by Representative Johnson. Properly motion and second, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think that we're by now all familiar with the situation at DCS and the problems that they've been having. Um, we know that there are children that have been sleeping in offices that have been staying in hospitals for literally 100 or 200 days uh, because there's no placement after they've been released by the physician. Um, 
I want to read the most recent letter which came to me this month from one of those workers, or I'm going to read part of it. I won't read the entire thing, but just to get an idea of what they're going through right now. Even though children are not in DCS offices, they are spending long periods of time in transitional housing, which quotes around transitional. Case managers are currently these children's primary caregivers. The children who are sitting, who we are sitting with are mostly have extreme behaviors or some type of disability. We are not trained to sit with or manage these um, children with disabilities. We don't have understanding of their disabilities. Um, they have been hit, um, kicked, bitten, uh, had to receive medical treatment. Um, and that's not to say that these, these are not bad kids, by the way. These are kids that are acting out because they are in trauma and they are in crisis. They've been removed from their homes and they do not feel they are in a safe place because they are currently, currently residing somewhere where every six hours a different per, the person sitting with them changes. They may not be in offices, but they are not in houses. They're not in homes and they're not in certified um, foster placements. Um, let's see, also there's the concern that these kids are not getting proper nutrition as they are mostly surviving on fast food and frozen food. In one of um, these articles, they mention a statewide handbook for fo to follow for sitting with children. Our region has not been told there's such a handbook and we have not been presented with such. We are in severe crisis. Effective case management for children and families is not happening because we can only put band-aids on the crisis and wait for the next one to appear. I'm a long-term employee with the department and this is the worst I've ever seen it. We are an agency who is supposed to prevent neglect. However, we seem to be one that is currently causing it. Staff are emotionally and physically exhausted. We need assistance now and not weeks or months down the road. We're on a verge of collapse or some sort of disaster happening. I am unable to sign my name as fear of retaliation, but this is my cry for help. DCS children deserve better and so do the staff. This bill is asking for a case cap of 12. That is the social work standard. I know there are folks out there talking about a 20 cap. 20 cap is what we had during Brian A. The situation was better, but the situation was not, um, uh, it wasn't being successful. We didn't have successful outcomes. We still had people leaving the department. When you go to 12, as some states have done, you see employees that stick with it. You're not spending the money retraining employees and you um, are making sure that the kids are gonna be successful when they leave at 18. This bill is different from my bill last year that it allows some space to, to get down to 20 and then get down to 12. People are concerned about that um, and I understand that, but the reality is if these things get changed these folks, these workers that were there that left in good standing, they just couldn't do it anymore because it was their mental health, their physical health, and the life of their families. When they were working 14 hours a day, getting home after sitting, after doing their 50 plus caseload, then they would sit with a child for six hours. That place where they sit with the children might be two hours from where they live. One worker drove home, got home from her work day at 4 a.m. and had to get up at 6 to get her kids ready for school. You cannot maintain that type of a schedule. And we need to do whatever it takes to meet that social work standard and make sure that the kids are successful and the workers are productive. And uh, that's what this bill does. Are there any questions for Representative Johnson? Questions been called for. Without objection, we'll be voting on House Bill 1403. Um, moving out to civil. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 The no's have it. If you want to be uh, recorded as a no, please tell the clerk. And Madam Chair, I want to okay. go ahead. I'm going to yes. take the next one next off is notice. A, oh, you want to do that? Yeah, it's got. Um, it, it, the language doesn't stretch across all departments and it could cause confusion. 
So we're going to take that off notice and get it in line so that it doesn't cause confusion between other departments. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So next we have item number 12, um, House Bill 19. I think he wanted to roll that to the Hill as well. So without objection, we will roll uh, House Bill 19 to the Hill. So next we have number 13, um, House Bill 467 uh, by Representative Timmer. You are properly motioned and second, and you're recognized. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. I appreciate your uh, your time. And uh, I knew this was going to be a good bill when I told my sister and brother-in-law about this at family dinner, and they immediately had a spirited discussion on who gets the good dog and who would have the bad dog uh, it, during a divorce. But uh, seriously, uh, I, I never thought about what happened in a pet in a contentious divorce until it was brought to my uh, attention by uh, one of my constituents, Tim Shrum, uh, who who is here today. Uh, and that's why I'm helping to, uh, to do this law to push uh, and clarify Tennessee divorce law to uh, consider animal welfare during divorce proceedings uh, and custody disputes. Uh, my constituents and divorce attorneys I've spoken to have found pet custody challenging uh, in proceedings and there needs to be more state guidance uh, on how to approach this matter so that pets are treated uh, less like property and more like family. Um, and I'm hopeful this bill will help resolve pet uh, custody issues before they become a problem and reflect the uh, importance of pets on our lives. Uh, this permissive bill uh, simply states the court may provide for the ownership or joint ownership of any pet or companion animal owned by parties taking into consideration the well-being of the animal. Um, so thank you for your time and consideration. I would respectfully request uh, that we go out of session and hear my, my constituent, Tim Shrum. Okay. Without objection, we're going to go out of session. And Mr. Shrum, if you could come up and introduce yourself and who you're with, please. Out of session. Hello, my name is Tim Shrum, and I am here today on behalf of man's best friend. Through the unfortunate circumstances of life, I lost my best friend. And throughout the process, I was surprised at how pets and companion animals are viewed in Tennessee family law. The purpose of this bill is to establish a framework that ensures the fair and equitable treatment of animals during divorce or separation while considering the well-being of that animal. Now, if I'm sitting where you're sitting, uh, I may be a little skeptical hearing that, and I may be thinking a few questions if I'm you. The first thing that I may, might be thinking is, well, this sounds nice, but isn't this already within the judge's discretion? Don't judges already have the broad discretion to make this choice? And I agree with you. Uh, judges do have broad discretion. But the broad discretion does not negate the vital role that you sitting there play in the legislature with giving guidance and direction. As a committee dedicating to addressing very important issues, um, someone could play the quote devil's advocate card, raising the same objection with any legislation that you bring, saying, you know, why do we need to give this guidance to the court? Why do we need to lay out these different factors when distributing marital property? It's already, the, the judge has the discretion to do it. Uh, this, um, this empowers you as legislatures to give the court the guidance that, that it needs in this. Uh, the, the second thing it might be, is this gonna create a kind of a mess um, where the transporting of the animal, the uh, back and forth, what, what if someone's late, uh, you know, with, with, with bringing the animal. And it's important to note that judges already now grant joint ownership. Judges now grant um, visitation with companion animals through orders of the court. And I have a copy of a few if anyone's interested in seeing it, um, as well as signing of marital dissolution agreements. Um, bills have come before this committee where a uh, wisdom came out in the question asked, is, is, is this a uh, solution looking for a problem? Um, and this bill will give courts that guidance. And the question to ask is, are courts currently being flooded with contempt petitions over disagreements? 
from the cases reviewed and the judges consulted that this isn't happening. So we don't even have to have a what if. We can look currently that this is happening, this is being ordered. Are these disagreements that are being brought out as possibilities actually happening? Mr. Strom, I'm sorry, but your time is up. That's great. Are there any questions? Mr. Strom? Uh, Representative I, Turnigan. I'm really interested in what you were saying. Would you finish your statement, please? You're recognized. Thank you. Um, yeah, so from, from the cases reviewed um, with local judges, the, the famous Judge Robinson here, here locally, um, you know, I've got copies of his orders where this has been done. Um, the companion animals have been granted joint ownership. So it's not that we're asking anything new, it's just bringing this guidance to the attention. While they have the discretion, they may not have their attention on it. Um, and last point is mediators are gonna have a big role in this. Instead of totally ignoring it as a, I can't be bothered with this, mm. I, I see the mediators uh, helping to come to an agreement where this doesn't even get to the, to the court as well. Okay. follow up. You're recognized. So, they have discretion. You basically want them to, to codify what they're already doing with some guidance. Is that correct? Mr. The, Schramm, you're the, 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 They are doing this. Um, yeah. It's unfortunately, as was described to me, um, it, it's a coin flip. Mm -hmm. And it, it, equitable distribution of marital property mm -hmm. should not be a coin flip based on which judge you get. Uh, it should be brought to their attention as a guidance from the legislature this is this is an important issue we we um, you know c consider the well-being of the animal in the Good Samaritan law that that was only for breaking a window if there is a child in in the car that the next year I believe representative Hawk made national national news because he extended that well-being consideration to a pet and that, that, that would be a, another example. Any other questions? Thank you for being here today. We're going to go back into session. Representative Hemmer, you're recognized. Um, Let me uh, say first, I think this is the first time you've been in our committee, isn't it? Um, I came earlier, but I had to roll it. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, thank you for uh, for allowing uh, my constituent to testify on this important issue. Uh, you know, this is something I, I originally was skeptical about at first, but as I learned more and looked at how other states that have implemented this law have not seen any unintended consequences actually talking to my judge, uh, 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 the Judge Robinson, who's one of my constituents who handles a lot of the majority of divorces here in Davidson County. Uh, you know, he, he kind of the comment to me, yes, this would actually be really helpful to me. Um, I even talked to a constituent this morning that I was unaware of, was telling me a, a funny slash sad story about uh, a jury trial that she had to be in and was the foreman uh, due to a really contentious pet custody uh, case. So what we're seeing here is, uh, is really some, uh, you know, items where some judges are, are doing it, some judges are not, and we just want to make sure this is clarifying law. This is something that, that could be done uh, and, and provide some additional common sense guidance uh, that is permissive that we think would help uh, uh, not weaponize pets in these really contentious dis divorces. And with that, I ruin in my motion. Thank you. Ripson Garrett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for bringing this. We've, we've spoken, you've probably heard my concerns, but I'm going to re- um, say them today is that a couple of things is that the legislation says any pet or companion animal and so it's going to be where is it going to stop are we going to have people fighting over a fish over a squirrel over a flying squirrel over a guinea pig we're going to have kids arguing back and forth of who owns the hamster right that's going to make this more litigious that's going to your your witness that came and although i, I hate that he lost his his pet but it's just in the divorce setting, and I try these, so I've been in the courtroom uh, doing this as part of my law practice, is that it's to divide up a marital estate for the assets and liabilities, it's absolutely not a coin flip, right? I mean, there are about 15 to 16 to 17 different factors that are taken into by statute that the judge has to follow, and one of those is deciding for everything about where a pet would go 
based upon the circumstances, right? And so this is already happening. This is already taking place. This statute, if it becomes law, is going to create more litigation in an already emotional setting where unfortunately parents do use their children as a weapon against the other for X, Y, or Z. Now we're going to allow them to use the pets. This doesn't defeat that. This makes that worse because now there's a statute saying that, well, we got to take into the well-being of the animal. I don't know how someone would prove that. You, you can't bring, you're going to bring the animal in the courtroom and have them, which one it comes to? Does it come to mom? Does it come to dad? Is that the well-being of the pet? Um, we are creating a lot of issues with this um, in the litigation sense that's not going to, I think, achieve the success of how someone can, or the judge can determine who ends up getting the, the pet because the pet is personal property and that's the way it's defined and what circumstances will lead after a divorce who has a home, who doesn't travel, if the pet's going to be at home, going to be able to go outside, all of that is going to be able to be considered at the judge's discretion. And we're really going to be putting this issue in the middle of cases that I don't believe should be there. So with that, uh, I've got some real concerns with the legislation. At this point, I just can't support it because I think it's going to create more problems than we have. But thank you very much, though. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And uh, to the sponsor, first of all, I want to uh, thank you for the way you have worked this bill. You've uh, uh, been very diligent, but very fair, and, and it certainly, I think, approached all of us about it. And again, if you work all your bills like this, you'll be very successful up here. There, you did ask me if I'd go back home and talk to my divorce uh, uh, judges and my divorce attorneys. And, and I didn't get hold of the judges, but I got hold of two prominent attorneys in my county and and they uh, gave them the bill they read them and they kind of sadly rolled their eyes and said man I think we're going this would open up a slippery slope mm -hmm. and under the and again I'm not a lawyer by any means as they said under the equitable distribution of personal property that the judges have within their discretion and if the judges is doing their job the pet will get in the right place so but I, anyway, I went back, I talked to them, and so again, I, I appreciate you bringing the bill, appreciate how you worked it, uh, but I sadly will probably be voting against it. So. Oh, I'm sorry, Chairman Farmer. And, and thank you, I, and a couple things have been brought up, Representative Garrett, Representative Brick, and just really, they, 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 they covered just about everything I wanted to ask. In fact, I was going to quote, I was going to say, I, I, I'm afraid this may set some precedent that they may have some members come in and try to add some other things that may be treated of that beyond property. You know, we, we all love our animals. I, I love my, my dogs and cats, and, and they're, when we lose one, it's one of the hardest things you can lose other than a family member or a friend or a human being, right? But I, I guess I'm curious, just specifically, what is this bill doing or providing guidance on that's not already in place. Tell me just specifically what this is saying to our courts and our judges that's going to help them make this decision. Yeah, and I'll, I'll take my, him. Thank you, sorry, yeah. Madam Chairman. Uh, yeah. My constituent, I think, has a, a perfect example. You know, as uh, pets are treated as property today in the law, he had a uh, you know situation where his pet was uh, purchased with, by his fiance, which uh, mm -hmm. didn't end up being his wife. Uh, Technically, the letter of the law, they, you know, he improved the property. He was it fed. He cared for the animal. Um, however, when assets were decided, it was not chosen as a, a joint ownership. It was chosen as property, and the judge gave that situ that property to to his former wife. Um, however, you know, from consultation with other attorneys I've talked to, it, you know, you've had very very contentious divorces you've had you know what, what I would just call unequitable treatment on this and so again the comment I got from my judge who, who does oh, you know thousands of these that, that this would be helpful uh, and, and this would help uh, bring down what uh, normally is a very contentious time in, in these divorce I'm a child of divorce I know uh, how hard these things can be on on others uh, and on family members, and so anything we can do to take down the temperature 
in these things and given, you know, again, common sense discretion for judges to, to look into the specific situations as, as uh, a representative from Sumner County mentioned, you know, there already is a list of guidance uh, that they go through. Um, so why not we provide one more additional layer that would help uh, them, them do the job and do what we all want, which is, you know, to, to take care of these pets and have uh, people be able to, uh, you know, have their wishes done and, and have a non-contentious divorce proceedings if possible. Thank you. Representative Farman, Chairman Farman. And I appreciate that. And as Representative Brickin said as well, I appreciate how hard you've worked this piece of legislation. You've, you've done your consistent right, no matter what happens today, whether it passes or if it, if it stays here. Just once you know that, once your constituent and constituency to know that as well. But, you know, there, there's no parameters in place other than the, what's set out in the statute in regards to property. Pets are a property, and, and that's, that's not going to change. Uh, I don't foresee that changing anyways, but uh, but I don't see any reason why courts that if they feel strongly about this a lot of times Courts and judges will put down what and they'll, they'll create their own local rules mm -hmm. right? And they'll ask lawyers to, to create things and have things turned in by a certain amount of time So I don't see any reason why if there's a jurisdiction somewhere where you had an elected judge And maybe the constituents go to that judge and say hey, this is what we'd like to see or we're going to replace you maybe in their local rules they could put down some parameters of maybe some uh, reasoning why a pet, a dog, what, what not needs to go where, and maybe they hear those briefs beforehand. I think maybe they could do that by local rule without having us to step in and do this. Uh, also, I had, had some issues with the enforcement component of this. I mean, tying up court time, hearing uh, contempt uh, beyond that of just uh, maybe what's in the marital dissolution agreement, contempts on the placement of an animal, maybe visitation of an animal, taking up time to that of a child. Uh, it, it concerns me as well. I don't know if this gets there or not, but I know a lot of members, we, we've had a lot of discussion about this. You and I have, and so have the members of this committee. So we haven't taken this lightly, but um, I just think there's a lot, a lot of questions out there and like what ifs. So at this point in time, I'm not gonna be able to support your piece of legislation, but I do appreciate your hard work and everything you've done. Representative Jernigan, any more questions? Have I a motion, Madam Chair? Excuse me? I would like to renew my motion. Okay. <laughs> Question on. Question has been called for. Without objection, we'll be voting on House Bill 467. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 The no's have it. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Next, we have item uh, 14, 1177 by Representative Garrett. Motion. Rep off notice. Off notice. Okay. Okay, next we have number 15 on the uh, House Bill 589 by Representative Gant. Motion. Second. Property motion and seconded on House Bill 589. Representative Gant. Thank you, uh, Chairman and Committee. And this is another piece of legislation that came out of um, Speaker Sexton's um, uh, Juvenile Justice uh, Subcommittee, or I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Ad Hoc Committee this past uh, fall and what this legislation does is the pr present law generally provides that all applications certificates records reports and all legal documents petitions and records made or information received that directly or indirectly identify a child or family receiving services from the department of children's services or that identify the person who made a report of harm must be kept confidential and not be disclosed except if a certain exceptions apply however present law also specifies certain circumstances when the department must release information one such circumstance is when a law enforcement agency grand jury or court requests the records upon presentation of an appropriate court order this bill adds to this provision that records I'm sorry, that records must also be released to a district attorney general upon presentation, presentation of an appropriate court order. And Madam Chair, this, as I mentioned, comes from our ad hoc committee that you chaired um, this past fall. And, and I will say that we have got a lot of positive uh, legislation this session from that ad, ad hoc committee and and would like to see this uh, pass out of committee today. 
Thank you, Representative Gant. We worked hard all summer on the Juvenile Ad Hoc Committee, and thank you for your hard work as well. And I know sometimes uh, you didn't feel real well or missed a little bit and watched us uh, uh, or put your two cents worth in virtually, but uh, this is a good bill. That's This is one of the things that we heard that this is much needed. We heard from repeatedly, so it's it's good, and thank you for bringing it. Yeah, uh, 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 Madam Chair, you, br you brought back a memory. I think I was actually in the hospital bed uh, texting with you <laughs> while you were live in committee, so, uh, yes, so and that, afterwards, that yes. brings back some fond memories. So, yeah. sorry about that. But well, we were just proud that you were there with us. So, um, are there any other questions? Oh, Representative Brickin. What's uh, any reason why uh, district attorneys would have been excluded from this? Um, allowing to uh, uh, apply for this order before? It sounds like it, I mean, was that just an oversight, you think? Representative Kent. I think we're just reaffirming that in this legislation to clarify that that is the case. Okay. That's fine. That's Any other questions? Questions being called for. Without objection, we will be voting on House Bill 589, moving out to civil justice. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. You move out to civil pool. Next, we have item 16, House Bill 1393 by Representative Harris. Thank you. Second. Probably motion and second. And I see that you have an amendment. Which one do you want to go with? A amendment number, Chairman, is going to be 4725. That's not what I have. Amendment 4725. I think. Give us a minute. That's not what, what oh, I I'm have. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on one second. Zero zero four seven two five. Okay. Does it make the bill? Yes, this one does okay. make the bill. Do we want to go ahead and put the amendment on the bill? We're going to take a brief recess, a one minute recess. Oh. Two weeks ago. We are back in session. So that was a technical change, correct? Yes. Okay. All right. So we're ready to proceed. You're back on us. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman. And so um, House Bill uh, 1393, 
Uh, this bill would basically uh, require that when we do need to vote on oh, that amendment. I'm okay. sorry. Yes, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, Chairman Farmer. Yeah, if I if I could, um, I want to make a motion that we hear this amendment. But can we know what the amendment does first? As yeah, I understand, it's fairly, it's really short. Yeah. So could you just tell us what it does? Yes. Yeah, so so um, the amendment basically just changes from um, there was a word change in here where it said guardian must submit to drug testing um, to demonstrate that the parent or guardian is able to maintain a drug free uh, lifestyle. Fiscal review says that drug basically said drug testing meant more than one drug test. And so in order to change that to just one drug test, I had to go back and change the word from drug testing to a drug test. Okay. And so it just makes it more singular. Motion on the amendment then. Second. Properly motion is seconded. Uh, all those in favor of All those in favor of adding 4725 onto uh, House Bill 1393, say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. It's on the bill. You are recognized on 1393 as amended. Thank you, Chairman. And so um, this piece of legislation is already um, passed on the Senate side, but um, what we've done is what we're asking for is that a requirement in the permanency planning um, um, for a child, once a child is returned back to uh, the custody of the parent that it, during the um, home visits the home trial before the end of the home trial visits done by dcs that a drug test be performed to make sure that the parent was given while they didn't have the child they made it out um, clean and clear through a clean drug test that before they were given the child and at the end of that home visit they still were clean and clear and are able to maintain a household that is drug free any questions for Representative, Representative Brick, can you recognize? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I assume the fiscal note that I have, the, the eight and a half million state increase and the four million federal has been modified. Have you, have you got the new fiscal note just on the A test? Yes, and so they would cut it into half and it'd be $326,200. Four million or what? Three, 326,200. At the state level? Or? Yes, increase the state expenditures, $326,200. Oh, that's a, from $8 million down to three hundred and something thousand. Yeah, that's a Big difference. $199 okay. drug test okay. for uh, approximately 3,295 um, parents. Thank you. Any other questions? We ready to vote? All those in favor of House Bill 1393, moving out to civil pool, as amended, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Ayes have it. You Thank move you. Out. So next we have House uh, number 17, House Bill 1394 by Representative Harris. Thank you so much, Chairwoman. So um, this piece of legislation here, and I'll just, oh, I'm sorry, motion. Second. Yeah. Good. Uh, this piece of legislation, House Bill 1394, uh, would make it into a, um, requirement that the Department of Children's Services not uh, with the money that are the dollars that are collected um, on when it comes to survival benefits disability benefits or otherwise from the Social Security Administration or the Department of Veterans Affairs on behalf of a child in the custody of the department uh, that the department shall receive and hold those funds in a trust account for the child to be able to receive um, those funds um, upon the child's 18th birthday and rather than taking those funds from the child and putting it in our bottom line that we actually give it back to the child. Um, I know that there's some discussion that needs to happen around this one with DCS um, being able to do this. And so what I'm gonna do is uh, take this one off notice and bring it back and work with them um, for next year. Okay, without objection, House Bill 1394 is off notice. So next we have my bill. And that brings us to item 18, House Bill 641 by our Chair Lady Littleton. Members? Motion. Got a motion? We got a second. Looks like, uh, Madam Chair, we have, uh, you have an amendment 4917. That's Would you like to move forward with that? Mm -hmm. Member, sounds like she does. Uh, do I have a motion and a second? Motion. Second. We already go ahead and vote to add that amendment. 
Looks like we do. All those in favor, adding House Amendment 4917 to House Bill 641, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. I was happy. Now we're back on the bill's amended. Thank Chair you, Lady Mr. Chairman. Uh, this requires the Department of Children's Services to conduct a home visit to determine whether our child will receive proper care and supervision in the home prior to notifying the court of its intention to place the child at home on a trial home visit. Members, any questions, comments before we vote? Seeing none, looks like we're ready to vote. Senate House Bill 641 as amended to civil full. All favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. I'll have it. Bill moves on. Brings us down to item 19, House Bill 914. By Chair Lady Littleton. A motion and a second. Motion. Very good. And I'm looking at two amendments, Madam Chair. I want to go with 4746, please. Motion. Remember, motion. Members, you heard that uh, House Amendment 4746. What Chair Lady would like to move forward with? I got a motion, got a second. We're going to adopt that. Adopt that amendment, members. Looks like we do. All those in favor of adopting House Amendment 4746 to House Bill 914, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. I have it. Now we're back on the bills amended. You're, you're recognized, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This authorizes the court to require a condition of allowing a child to remain with their parents or guardian when the child is under age of three and has been found in, uh, to be dependent and neglected and diagnosed with. Uh, NAS submission of documentation of the Department of Children's Services of compliance with preventative pediatric, uh, pediatric care consistent with the periodically schedule of the American Academy of Pediatrics until the child reaches three years of age. This is if there's an NAS baby, they have to follow it with a well baby care and um, to make sure that the child is okay. That, that well baby will be sent to the physician will send that to um, DCS. And, and thank you, Madam Chair, for that explanation. Members, you've heard the explanation. Do we have any comments or questions for the chair lady before we vote? I'm not seeing any. Looks like we're ready to vote to send House Bill 914 to Civil Justice Full Committee. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. I was happy. That brings us to item 20, House Bill 1121 by Chair Lady Littleton. Motion. Got a motion, got a second. Ma'am, you're probably recognized, and I don't see any amendments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that we need to work on this a little bit because of uh, Wilder being, I wasn't going to do this, but Wilder is an old facility, and we're not sure what we're going to do with it, so I think we need to work on this. So I just want to roll this to next year. Okay. Members, you heard, you heard that. Any objections in rolling House Bill 1121 to the first calendar of next year? Seeing no objection to the first calendar of next year. Thank you. And I want to say, I saw Jim Lehman in here a while ago, the new proud father. Uh, yeah, he's back early. So I think he's going to take his leave when his wife goes back to work. So uh, I think that was number three for him. But I missed it while he was here. But uh, congratulations to Jim and his new baby. Yep. Okay, so next we uh, have an item 21, House Bill 944 by Representative Motion. Alexander. Seconded. Properly motioned and seconded. Um, I do see an amendment. While you're doing that, I want to apologize for not taking you up earlier. I just came in from another bill, and I'm always flustered, so <laughs> I apologize for that. No, it was because I came in. It was all me, but uh, I do apologize. I love this committee, so I'm happy to come before you twice. Look at you. <laughs> so your amendment is? My amendment number is 005150. That is correct. Okay, it's, it's properly motioned and seconded. Let's go ahead and put it on before we vote, uh, before she explains it. Uh, all those in favor of adding uh, amendment 5150 to House Bill 944, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. You are recognized on 944 as amended. Thank you. Who does this, who is impacted by this bill? There are two categories of people. One is those uh, that are impacted by domestic abuse, and secondly, those who are considered a vulnerable adult. Um, that includes those living in advanced age, as well as those uh, who have a disability. The bill does three things. It defines financial abuse, it expands the 
domestic abuse to include financial abuse and expands abuse, uh, abuse and neglect of vulnerable adults to include financial abuse also of those adults. And where can we make these changes? Uh, the definition for financial abuse will be a new code section being housed underneath domestic abuse section of the TCA. And the new code section will be also cited as TCA Title 36, Chapter 3.8. For expanding abuse to financial abuse, this is added to the existing definition of domestic abuse. With that, I renew my question. Thank you for bringing my this. Uh, we all know that that's uh, an issue from time to time, not just watching it in the movies. We know that it happens for real. So thank you for bringing this. Are there any questions for, uh, questions been called? Without objection, we will be voting on House Bill Get the right paper. House Bill 944 as amended to go out to civil full. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Ayes have it. You move to full. Thank you, committee. Uh -huh. So next we have the special final calendar, uh, number 22, um, House Bill 1395. Oh, I, that's right. I'm getting ahead of myself. Next, we're going to bring up uh, number four that was rolled to the hill, House Bill 1258 by Representative Bidle. <laughs> Properly motioned and second, you are recognized, Representative Bidle, on House Bill 1258. Thank you, Chairman Littleton and committee. Uh, I'm and here on behalf to of Children us. and Family Affairs. Excuse me. <laughs> and welcome to Ch Children and Family Affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Senator Gardenhire. Wished I was saying I was here on behalf of Representative and Chairperson Sexton, but uh, speaker, but I'm not. Uh, <laughs> and behalf of Honorable Chancellor Atherton of Hamilton County, in hopes of adding protection for parties in an estate. Uh, currently under probate law, all parties of an estate are entitled to file an objection to claims from creditors. However, there are no ob obligations of the executor or the administrator to notify the interested parties that a creditor's claim is filed. These interested parties only have 30 days to submit an objection. Oftentimes, these claims are never objected because interested parties are unaware of the claim has not been filed. However, the bill simply requires the administrator to serve a copy of each claim within five days by U.S. mail to any party interested in the estate, either a creditor, distribu distributor, heir, or otherwise. Thank you for consideration on this. I know there are those who have more knowledge of this issue, and I'm willing to uh, try to seek answers or talk to legal. Thank you. Representative Stevens, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I have several concerns with this uh, bill. First off is the word serve. So whenever you talk about service, uh, that's kind of an enhanced level of notice. And to me, when you serve something by mail, that kind of indicates certified mail. So is that is the intent to serve them with certified mail or just uh, old fashioned mail with a stamp? You're recognized. Thank you, Chairperson. It was my understanding it was to serve them by US mail, not to serve them to the legal definition of the word. And we could correct that if necessary. Representative Roberts. Stevens, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Okay, that would make me feel somewhat better about this. Um, so whenever a probate case is filed, the executor or the administrator is supposed to send documents to the beneficiaries or the heirs about uh, the fact that the case is open. And then, of course, a notice goes in the local newspaper that tells the creditors they have four months to file a claim against the estate. So the beneficiaries or the heirs, uh, as the case may be, can go at any time to the clerk's office. All this is open to the public from 8 to 5, you know, wherever, whatever the hours are for the clerk. They can go and see what claims have been filed. Uh, they can call the clerk. I'm not sure that putting the more burden on the executor or administrator or the attorney for the estate is going to be good for the estate because it's going to be more costly. Now, every time a claim is filed, let's just say a claim is filed once a week for 12 weeks. So every time that a claim is filed, now the 
the attorney or the executor or whoever will have to go to the post office and send out another letter, another letter. But each time there's an additional creditor that's filed, you've got to notify all the creditors too. So at the end of that four-month period, it seems like that will be a better time to send out one notice to all the beneficiaries if this is an issue that we want to pursue and tell them, here's who all filed a claim to date. And uh, they do all get 30 days after that four months is over to file an, an objection if they want to do that then. So I'm, I'm not in favor of this the way it's written. I think it's going to drive up costs for the estates, and it's going to be a lot more work for people. And then what happens if somebody misses sending out the notice? Are they going to be personally liable for not notifying the, the beneficiaries? And I had a hypothetical in my mind. Uh, so if you've got a, a man and a woman that are married and uh, they have a blended family, and let's just say they're going to leave everything to the wife's kids. Uh, husband dies, wife is left and has all the money, and she's going to leave everything to the husband's kids. So they're all beneficiaries under her will. But her kids are interested parties, because if the will were to be set aside, then they're interested parties. So they're all going to have to get notices every time a, creditor's a claim is filed. And then, of course, every time a creditor is filed, they're all going to be getting more, a notice, too. So I think this is going to be a lot of work. It's a good intention uh, thing, but I think the best way to do it is going to be, if we're going to do this, to send it after the four months is over just one time instead of every single time a claim is filed. You're recognized. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Representative, I would just say that under no circumstances did I intend to carry a bill that would make it harder for lawyers to practice law or to increase the cost to the consumer. So if there is a way that we can look at uh, resolving this for those who have to deal with this every day like yourself, I'm open to the suggestion. Representative McCarrick. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. And Representative Biden, I think I appreciate you bringing the, the legislation. I share wholeheartedly with my with my seatmate here, Representative Stevens from um, from Rutherford County, uh, as I also do some probate work as well. And you're, you are going to increase cost with this. And then the or otherwise at the very end of this, I don't know what that means. I don't know what or otherwise is going to mean included in someone that we're going to have to keep mailing things to. In any time a type of pleading that's filed with the court, you would have what's called a certificate of service, and that gives the beneficiaries, it says to the court that you mailed the notice of whatever's being filed, and the word serve, I'm afraid, can mean personal service, which is the enhanced notice that we'd have to personally serve each creditor, distributee, heir, or otherwise. And so I don't believe this is in a great posture for language of what you're trying to accomplish. I, I am interested in Representative Stevens' suggestion about at the end of when the claims period is, when the statute runs, either four months from the date of publication or a year after the date of death, then there can be something mailed to the beneficiaries of whatever claims are out there because obviously that will affect whatever distributions come when the estate is finalized um, or when distributions are, are to be made. They'll know they have to pay legal debts of the estate, which are those that are filed, a claim has been filed against the estate. So I believe this is real or, or too vague to understand what we're trying to, uh, to accomplish in providing notice to creditors and then to creditors when there's another creditor that files a claim. So I think that we've got a lot of things going on here that I'm not sure we know what we're supposed to do when a claim is filed against the estate. So those are my concerns, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Representative Bottle. Representative Bottle. All I can do is agree with you totally to try to find a better way to make it more beneficial for families in a state situation to work with their counsel to get the issue resolved. So, uh, Would you like to take this off notice and then still be alive and work on it during the I, summer for next year? Yes, Madam Chairman. Because uh, this is going to be our last calendar. So. I, I think that would be an okay. appropriate action. Without objection, we're going to take it off notice. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have um, House Bill 1515 by Representative Shaw. You're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I come back. Uh, I have not been able to see the Senate sponsor, but it was agreed with the staff that they thought that that 45 days should come out of the amendment, but now that haven't had time to get that done. In fact, I was called back after I went back and left that in my office and 
I had borrowed some information from one of the members today, but basically I think what we were interested in is just what the caption of the bill says. First part of it is basically what we wanted to do. So I'm kind of at the will of this committee because we haven't had ch you know, a chance to, to talk to the Senate sponsor or to naturally to do another amendment at this particular time. Representative Stevens. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Was this filed as a caption bill, or was this something that was actually something that you wanted to accomplish? This, this was something we wanted to accomplish, but basically we wanted to just accomplish the incentive of deleting the $60 if the person do the premarital course. Representative. And uh, as Representative Garrett said earlier, the amendment doesn't say anything at all about the $60. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out how we got from there to here. Mr. Uh, Representative Shaw. And, 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 and that, Mr. Rep, I don't know the full answer. That's what I went to get the answer to. And, of course, the senator was busy. But according to her staff, I think that was her intention. I don't know if we just, if she just did not do the right amendment or sent me the wrong amendment. I honestly do not know. That's why I'm back here at the mercy of the of the committee because I, I think that was the in, her intentions as well as mine because that's why I took it because of the incentive of the 60 bucks but not to do anything to cause the courts any problem. Representative Shaw, I think we should just take this off notice and let you work on it. I don't think anybody here is happy with it right now. So without objection, it's off this. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, committee, for listening to me. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. So next we have uh, item uh, House Bill 19 by Representative Chisholm. Thank you, Chair Lady. You're recognized. Uh, House Bill 19, uh, in order to get it in the right posture, we're going to take this bill off notice so we can have further conversations to make sure that we have a good bill that's good for all Tennesseans. Without objection, you are off notice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there any other business? Oh, I'm sorry. We went to the special. There's a lot of confusion for me today. <laughs> Too many calendars here. Okay, so we are now on item uh, 22, House Bill 1395 on the special final calendar. You're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Motion. Thank you. Probably motion and second. And oh. I see you have an amendment. Okay, so I do have an amendment. This amendment technically is the one we put on last time, but the other amendment just came at 1201 that was supposed to have made it. But this, um, this bill was the... We, I went back and listened to the video and, uh, of our last committee, and one of the changes that we needed to make uh, was to make sure that the direct payments went to the insurance company. And so that's what that amendment was uh, intended to do. Uh, and so unfortunately it didn't make it. If we were to uh, move this out into the next committee, obviously it would be on there because the amendment number is 006420. I just have to get it put on there. We, we've just not done that at all this year. The I'm amendment sorry. was what time? Say, say that one more time, I'm sorry. When, when did you file the amendment? Oh, uh, it's been, it's put in, it's just not, I just received it back. Okay. No. No. Mm -mm. I literally just got the email. So it's our policy and our rule that we do not accept Amendments, especially if it's not filed in here. So, okay. Well, I will go ahead and take this one off notice. Okay. Thing and we'll just hope that we don't do it for the future. It, it'll go. It'll go to the clerk's desk. Thank you. So, without objection, House Bill 1395 goes to the clerk's desk. Oh. Now, are we ready? Is there any other business? This is it. So seeing no further, oh, Chairman Farmer. And first, unless there's some unforeseeable situation here, I know we're about to close subject to the call of Madam Chair, but I did want everybody to know that I have really 
and we have enjoyed serving under your uh, direction and appreciate all you do. I know you've worked really hard this summer. We all did, but you worked extraordinarily hard uh, for children of, of all the state of Tennessee and the country on our uh, ad hoc committee we were on, uh, dedicated to this committee. I know you care as much, if not more, than anybody in the General Assembly about children and family. And just uh, happy to have you where you're at. And thank Speaker Sexton for allowing you to serve as our chair lady. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you. It, thank you. I got all carried away and I didn't bring cupcakes or anything today. I don't know what's wrong with me, but we'll, we'll do something later to celebrate uh, being through, yes, dinner or something. But uh, I appreciate all of you too and your input and everything that you've brought to this committee. It's pretty diversified and we've learned a lot and we've done a lot of good things. And you know, I always say that if we can't save every child, we'll do it one at a time. So thank y'all very much. So without objection, we're adjourned. Without, subject to the call of the chair. We got that. <laughs>